I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. Today we're hearing a lecture from Cadmus Herschel, a PhD in philosophy teaching at the college level. Cadmus recently published a book called True to the Earth, Pagan Political Theology, and will be presenting a talk called True to the Earth and a Pagan Conception of the Self, first presented at Rewriting the Future, 100 Years of Esoteric Modernism and Psychoanalysis. I'd like to just start by thanking uh, the organizers, uh, Vanessa and Carl. Uh, It's an honor to be here. And it's such a beautiful location. It's breathtaking. Uh, Also, there's a bit of ancient Greek in this paper. And uh, although I know ancient Greek pretty well, my pronunciation is spotty. So if anyone out there knows ancient Greek well, I apologize. If you don't know it well, ignore everything I just said and assume everything I say is right. Uh, All right. In this paper, I would like to expand upon and add justification to some points I made in my book, True to the Earth, Pagan Political Theology, concerning pagan ideas of the nature of the self. In the book that I reference, I attempt to reconstruct the metaphysics and theology that undergird the pagan or polytheist worldview. The argument, roughly, is that a culture tends to have a, what I call a pagan worldview, when it is an oral society and that writing introduces changes to human thinking and culture that distort and eventually replace pagan insights. In other words, despite important and rich differences, I argue that all oral cultures are pagan in the sense that I intend, and they share, to a greater or lesser degree, foundational metaphysical insights. Beyond this, I attempt to show the extent to which these lost pagan insights are needed in our world and often, in many sense, are preferable to their monotheistic counterparts. And this is not strictly just related to monotheistic religion. Rather, I argue that there's a monotheistic metaphysics that undergirds even you know, versions of atheism and so on and so forth. To present these ideas a bit schematically, just to sort of summarize, oral cultures experience reality, both thinking and talking about it in a specific way, and uh, literate cultures in another way. The oral experience of reality is best identified with paganism, literacy, which gives rise to abstract ideas, and that's one of the major sort of shifts, uh, is best uh, uh, identified with the development of monotheism. It's the abstract ideas that make monotheism possible. To offer a brief overview of the aspects of this metaphysics that I present in the book, in chapter one I argue that a pagan metaphysics is committed to irreducible pluralism. This is a multiplicity without an overriding hierarchy and without one ultimate origin. Chapter two presents oral pagan thought as constituted in terms of an associative, relational, or paratactic, paratactic logic. Uh, There's a focus on active agents and actions, over abstract concepts or stable entities. These actions and agents are constituted through the relationships they exist within and carry out. Chapter 3 presents this focus on active agents as an understanding of all existing things as living. Here, the associative relational logic is understood in terms of an animism. One final aspect that ties the previous points together is offered in chapter four, a pluralistic cosmos of relationally understood active bodies with agency is best described through an event ontology. In other words, pagan metaphysics sees actions and events as fundamental and rejects the uh, basic nature and indeed the existence of substance. Whether the substance is understood as matter, which would include energy in a, a contemporary context, or understood as spirit, which might include mind, consciousness, soul, and so on, or both. Let me just read briefly from part of the book dealing with animism and consciousness to clarify that point a little. (coughs) Contemporary animism and panpsychism tend to understand the life all things are presumed to share in terms of consciousness. Much contemporary animism, not all contemporary animism. Consciousness, and especially the focus and obsession with it, is a major artifact of a specific turn that occurred in modern philosophy. 
That turn was itself a further development of the obsession with the non-material that is found in Plato. The view we are presenting here, instead, is one that existed before the artificial dualism of matter and mind, spirit, soul, consciousness. Oral societies don't think about, quote, consciousness the way that we do. For them, being aware is something we and our bodies do, not something that we have or that we are. The action of paying attention only gets turned into a, an abstract entity or property with the rise of writing, which pushes us to turn verbs and action words into timeless nouns. To say that everything is alive can mean that everything has agency, but not necessarily that everything has consciousness. Indeed, there is more confusion involved in the statement that we have consciousness than there is truth or illumination. So some of these points will be expanded upon. I know that was sort of a uh, rather heavy, very quick summary. Um, oral societies tend, to have, uh, expressly, uh, tend not to have expressly developed studies of theology or metaphysics. Instead, we must excavate how these societies experienced reality indirectly from oral teachings that were later preserved in writing and records of the transition periods from orality to literacy during which we can trace specific changes in the thinking of the culture. This task is made much more difficult to an extent that's very hard to overstate because most transitions from orality to literacy have occurred via the mediums of colonialism, religious conversion, conquest, and generally the domination of oral cultures by literate ones. This leads, even in the case of much anthropological work, to a process of, often unwittingly, translating the thinking of an oral culture into the ideology of a literate one, during which the unique aspects of oral culture are lost or concealed. For these reasons, the transition from morality to literacy in ancient Greece is particularly important as a paradigm case. Here, Literacy was developed primarily within the culture itself without foreign imposition or the uh, complication of religious domination. To put it bluntly, the new ideas presented by the pre-Socratic philosophers, by Socrates and Plato and Aristotle as well, can be understood as uh, an example of the first major manifestations of literacy's effect on the thinking of a culture. If you're wondering, all right, so what does literacy do to the way people think? looking at the philosophy of Plato is a fair example. Right? The ideas that Plato comes up with uh, are very likely the effect of literacy upon human thought. These ideas include that of an abstract perfect good or God that is the origin of everything in existence, the view of the universe as an ordered and hierarchical totality, the idea of a substantial unified or singular soul that fully captures the individuality of a person, as well as the, uh, in contrast, materialist theory of a fully physical universe made up of discrete types of matter or elements out of which everything is built and from which everything takes its nature. Each of these ideas is foreign and even unthinkable within a oral culture. Uh, let me stress for a moment that this is not meant to uh, be a negative point or a critical point about oral culture. Uh, the point is not that uh, there are these amazing things that we can think with writing and that we couldn't think them with uh, a purely oral culture. It's rather that there are insights that an oral culture found very natural and very fundamental that are very hard to think within a literate society. There are differences here and there's a cost to each of these differences. But it's not a, a distinction in terms of something like uh, less developed and more developed or anything like that. Uh, here I will primarily, in, in this paper, I'll primarily be concerned with Homer and the characteristics of oral composition that Homeric liter uh, literature uh, uh, best represents, with one brief exception. It is largely recognized that Homeric literature is primarily an oral artifact that is preserved at the birth of writing in Greece. Uh, the Homeric poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were actually composed over hundreds of years through oral composition, oral memorization. Uh, I want to look specifically at what can be learned about the concept of selfhood found in a pagan con uh, context as captured in Homeric epithets, similes, and concrete descriptions of the interpenetration of divinities and humanity. 
Allow me to offer some examples of the way that the metaphysics of an oral society is preserved in its language, since there's going to be a focus on language here. Oral language tends to have concrete words for events or actions that later become important abstract nouns in literate culture. Indeed, in most language, verbal variants of abstract nouns tend to be the older origin of those nouns. Uh, an easy example to grasp uh, for English speakers is the word being. Being is probably one of our most abstract sort of concepts. Uh, however, its gerund form obviously points to the fact that in some sense it derives from a verbal basis. Right? Before you have the concept of existence, you instead have the event or the actions of existing. Uh, to give you an example from Homer, a key example in Homer is that there's no word for nature in the Homeric poems. There's only a verb form, naturing, if you will. Uh, classical period texts will have an abstract noun, phusis, for nature, but the earlier Homer only uses the term fue, which means something like to grow. So there's growing or blooming, but there's no the great thing that is growing. This is part of what I, uh, I point to when I suggest that oral societies are working from an event ontology, one in which actions and events are what are ultimately real. There's growing, but not necessarily any grower. Other abstract nouns, such as goodness or virtue, which Plato is so obsessed with, are only encountered in specific examples, such as good ships or Achilles' virtue on the field of battle. They are relative terms defined by their context. This problem arises uh, repeatedly in Plato's dialogues when Socrates asks his interlocutors for definitions of abstract concepts and inevitably receives concrete examples. It's almost laughable, almost every dialogue, you know, what is courage? And you'll get an example of Achilles doing this, right? And then Socrates will say something weird like, no, I want to know what courage is in itself by itself. And the people he's talking to are utterly confused and have no idea what he's looking for. Um, so this causes Socrates a lot of frustration. It was clear that the idea of abstract general definitions was very foreign and hard to grasp for Greek culture, even several centuries after the dominance of writing had begun. When looking to oral texts, such as those of Homer, I tend to look first at the most definitive structural characteristics of oral composition, since these are most distinctly of oral origination. There's something we know is not being imported by writing. The two most famous such structural characteristics in Homer are what are called Homeric fixed epithets and Homeric similes. Uh, so I will look at these uh, and see what they might tell us about the understanding of the self that we find in Homer. We usually think of epithets as brief descriptions that capture the nature of a thing. The city that never sleeps might be an epithet for New York City. Uh, in Homer, there are so-called fixed epithets that provide essential elements to the meter of the poems. One reason they're called fixed epithets is because they're giving necessary structure to the meter. So anytime you need a certain metrical characteristic, you can just import an appropriate epithet into the line. Uh, some only appear applied to certain characters or things. There are ones that seem to be specific. Uh, rosy-fingered for the dawn. Nothing else uh, is called rosy-fingered except the dawn in Homer. Uh, another one, this is actually my favorite epithet, is palutropon. Uh, this is only applied to Odysseus. It means of many turnings, and it's usually translated as clever, which I hate. But yeah, uh, Odysseus is the man of many turnings, palut uh, palutropon. Uh, while most others will be applied to many different characters when the specifics of the situation are appropriate and the poetic meter allows or requires them. A good example here is godlike. All kinds of uh, heroes are called godlike, although usually it's only the heroes who have actual divine parentage. So Achilles, uh, Diomedes, right, they're called godlike. So we get godlike Achilles or Dios Achilleos. Uh, let me draw on... Uh, my one non-Homeric example to clarify the nature of epithet. 
in the Greek magical papyri, which come much, much later, right? Uh, in the Greek magical papyri, many of which either capture in writing chants that were previously passed down orally or maintain oral compositional characteristics, even if they're not themselves uh, of oral origin, we find long lists of what seem like descriptions of the spirits or divinities that one is attempting to contact. Here's an example in English, and then I'll play with the Greek a bit. Uh, so this is from uh, the fourth uh, uh, scroll, the fourth papyri in the PGM, uh, Greek magical papyri. O child of Zeus, dart shooter, Artemis, Persephone, shooter of deer, night shining, triple sounding, triple voiced, triple headed, Selene, triple pointed, triple faced, triple necked, the goddess of the triple ways, hail goddess and attend your epithets. O heavenly one, harbor goddess who roam the mountains and are goddess of the crossroads. O nether one, goddess of depths, eternal goddess of darkness. What the English translation here makes it very hard to see is that most of these lengthy descriptions are single words. And most of the lines of this text are only three words long. And there is almost no sentence structure. There is one part uh, here, actually two parts, that have a bit of sentence structure, but mostly these are just names. It's a list of names that then get translated as harbor goddess or who roam the mountain or goddess of the crossroads. So let me reread re the last four lines in Greek to stress that they are literally just a list of single words capturing each of these ideas alone. Uh, now, the first line is a sentence. It has sentence structure. And then from there, you get just single word descriptions. So the first line is, hail goddess and attend your epithets. Then we get, O heavenly one, harbor goddess, who roam the mountains and are goddess of the crossroads. O nether one, goddess of depths, eternal goddess of dark. Right, so after that first line, it's just lists of names. So we get, Kai Reithea, Kai Sasin, Eponumies, Epa Kusan, Orenia Limeniti, Ori Plane, Enodia Te, Nerteria Buthia, Ionia Scotia Te. Right, so each of those at the end is just a name, right? So, for example, uh, if you're looking for uh, who roam the mountains, it's just Oriplane, who roam the mountains, right? Each of these is a name in and of itself. So this chant is just a list of epithets, as the text mentions itself, attend your epithets. It's necessary to dig a bit into this idea of the epithet, because the archaic Greeks didn't understand it at all the way that we do. This should become clear when we consider that what we identify as a given person or a divinity's proper name was just as often an epithet to begin with. Patroclus, for example, right, Achilles' well-known companion, uh, this is not just a name, but means glory of the father, right? So the name is also an epithet. Even the name uh, Hecate, the goddess uh, the previous chant likely calls, possibly derives from the epithet far-sighted or far-shooter, which is often applied to Apollo as well. This is not clear, it's debated, but this is a po possible origin. There is no clear line in ancient Greece between epithet and name. Even in the admittedly much later chant from the Greek magical papyri, the term for epithet is epinumies, which basically means a name given based on something else. Right, so a given name based on some other characteristic of the thing. And it's formed from the word uh, anima, which just means name. The paradigmatic example here is likely peliado. Uh, this is an eponumies for Achilles. It's a, a, it means son of Peleos. So Achilles is named from or named for his father here. His father gives him this name. Similar, similarly, uh, Hecate is a nodia. She's named from her connection to the crossroads. But Patroclus is just as much named for his father's hope for glory. And yet we, the contemporary reader, would distinguish these two. Like, Enodia might be a title, but Patroclus is a proper name. And this distinction is not uh, at all in these texts. If epithets are just names, what does this uh, tell us? What does our focus on pagan names tell us? First, names in a pagan context are unavoidably plural. Every one and thing has many names, and ultimately there is no one true name. 
This becomes an obsession later in a lot of monotheistic culture. And you think about the story of Adam naming the animals and so on and so forth. The true name of a thing is meant to capture somehow its essence. And this becomes an obsession in Plato as well. Socrates uh, speaks often about how we properly name something to arrive at its true name. Uh, in the Greek, uh, the Greek pagan culture, the sort of older culture, there is no one true name which uh, could capture the essence of a thing. Names are also shared. Uh, Hecate is not the only Enodia, nor is Achilles the only godlike one. These names are all clearly relational. They derive from the relationships the named thing takes on and is found within, and they weave interconnections with many things that share the same name. As so well demonstrated in the chant from the Greek magical papyri, names are also paratactic. I had mentioned this earlier. Parataxis is the practice of listing things without an organizing hierarchical structure. And it's a major characteristic of oral poetry, such as Homer's. Uh, the list of names of Hecate are not organized according to any prioritizing logic. None is more or less important than the other in and of themselves. This is a model of pluralism without totalizing, organizing structure. There's no uh, ultimate, uh, well, structure here to organize these different characteristics in. This is also the logic of what you call, could call and also. You see this in the Homeric hymns. Each Homeric hymn ends with, and I will sing your praise, and another god also. Every hymn ends with, and another also. There's always another god, there's always another hymn to sing. So uh, finally, names could be taken on and put off. Names can change. You can lose names and so on. So there's a wealth of examples of dramatic changing of names, especially in relation to the gods. The few fearful furies are renamed the Eumenides, or kindly-minded ones, in order to try to appease them and calm their rage. Uh, Hecate becomes propolis and Oreon of Persephone, this means the one who goes before and follows after Persephone, because of her presence both at the abduction and the return of Persephone. She's there before Persephone and after Persephone. Perhaps most dramatically, in the Homeric hymn to Hermes, we are told the story of how when Hermes was one day old, he invented the musical instrument, the lyre, and stole Apollo's cattle. And when found out, he exchanges the lyre for Apollo's cattle. This is how Apollo becomes the god of music and the lyre. He doesn't invent it. Hermes invents it. Hermes gives it to him in exchange for his cattle. Uh, so this then makes Apollo the leader of the muses. This is one of his epithets, musagates. And this is how Hermes becomes uh, Epimelios, the guardian of the flocks. Apollo was guardian of the flocks, now Hermes guards the flocks. Hermes was the inventor of the lyre and that type of music, now Apollo is officially connected to it. The gods have exchanged names and in doing so become different than what they were. Here we see that the selfhood of the gods themselves is fluid. It's open to changes based on relationships they form or that are thrust upon them. Hermes changes Apollo's identity and by doing so changes his own as well. Let us turn to the consideration of Homeric simile now. Uh, Homeric similes are extended comparisons in general of two contrasting and often conflicting views of life. Uh, for example, the human and divine world will be contrasted with, uh, or rather compared with and connected to, the world of animals and of nature. There's also uh, an interesting contrast that happens where the content of the poem will be uh, heroic. You've got heroes and warriors, and the content of the simile is usually agrarian. So the similes are about farmers and about you know, these very non-heroic subject matters. Uh, internal linguistic clues have led to the conclusion that the similes are some of the oldest parts of the Homeric poems. So more than just comparing the anthropomorphic and natural, they, uh, the similes also contrast the heroic and the agrarian. In the similes, ships become horses and slain warriors become cattle slaughtered by farmers and so on. Allow me to offer one of the most striking of the Homeric similes as an example. So this is from the, uh, the Iliad. Uh, so the Myrmidons, these are Achilles' warriors, they're finally allowed to go to battle. Achilles gives them permission, and Patroclus uh, leads them from the ships, and they're compared to uh, hordes of wasps that are provoked by playful boys. Straight away they poured forth like wasps by the roadside, which boys habitually provoke, always taunting them. Wasps that have their homes by the road. 
Faultless boys, they make a common evil for many people. Those wasps, if some traveler going by unwittingly disturbs them, summon up all their defensive spirit, and each one of them flies forth and fights in defense of his offspring. With heart and spirit like theirs, the Myrmidons poured then from among the ships. The important point here is that the similes do not just offer a comparison based on some shared appearance, but rather also capture surprising and even subversive shared temperaments and fates. The Myrmidons here are this fierce group of great Greek warriors, and they're described as a common evil for many people. Right? So you see that there's a tone of criticism of the very warlike culture that's glorified in the body of the poem itself. They're destined to be killed as easily as small, fragile, if dangerous insects. This isn't just poetic, but would argue, uh, uh, but would uh, instead, I would argue, offer an insight into the nature and identity of the Greek warriors. The human and natural world and the heroic and agrarian world are not divided here, but rather in the simile we see that they are ontologically interwoven and penetrating, with these interconnections destabilizing the surface appearance of each side of the simile. Right? Each side is altered by its relationship to the other. Before more explicitly stating my conclusions, I want to look at some of the more overt content. I've looked at some structural elements. Let's look at some actual content of Homer's work. For this purpose, let us consider Book 5 of the Iliad. This book features the near apotheosis of the Greek water, uh, warrior, uh, Diomedes. So in Book 5, Diomedes is empowered by Athena. Uh, and this, this book is uh, really amazing. So Athena gives Diomedes wrath and strength. It's fascinating because in this book, the gods are everywhere. They fight on the field of battle, beside and with humans. Some are even injured. Aphrodite famously is injured by Diomedes. They whisk humans out of the battle to save them, and they appear back into the battle to give counsel to some of the warriors. Book five represents the world of the gods and men at its highest level of mingling. What is most striking about this mingling is that for the careful reader, it leaves profoundly unclear where the gods end and the humans begin. Let us begin first with Diomedes himself. We are told that Athena temporarily granted him strength and rage, that she made him blaze with fire, and that she made his limbs, feet, and hands light. More than this, she repeatedly speaks to him, counseling him throughout the battle. At one point, a Trojan warrior sees Diomedes on the field of battle and states that it looks like the shield, helmet, and horse of Diomedes, but, quote, it may be a god, I am not sure. Not without God does he rage so, but some one of the immortals mantling in, his, in mist his shoulders stands close beside him, end quote. No more can we be sure whether this is Diomedes or a god, for Diomedes is so empowered and led by Athena, from his strength and appearance to his emotions and decisions, it is unclear if we would best say he's inspired, possessed, replaced by her. Throughout the book, and indeed Homeric literature, gods appear as specific mortals, speaking as them and fighting as them. Sometimes they are recognized in this and sometimes not, but it's unclear when or even if we should conclude that there is a work of illusion going on and when instead the, divi uh, the divinity and human have simply become one. This has led some ancient scholars to propose that archaic and Mycenaean Greeks may have seen all emotion and thought as coming directly from the gods, a psychology via the divine. One thing is clear, as swiftly as the gods pop in and pop out of the battle, so do they pop in and pop out of particular human forms. My contention is that the question of when we have a god appearing as a given human, and when we have a human inspired by a given god, is an indiscernible and meaningless distinction that did not exist for the high pagan Greeks, the archaic Greeks. The gods lived in and through humans, and humans lived in and through the gods in ever more complex interweavings. Heraclitus recognizes this as well. My favorite Heraclitus fragment is fragment, 20, uh, uh, fragment 62, sorry, uh, which roughly is uh, immortal mortals and mortal immortals, each living the other's lives and dying the other's deaths. Right, so the mortal and the immortal lives in and out of each other. It is not then a question of illusion or replacement at all. This point becomes all the clearer when we investigate the etymology of terms for virtue, which, most, uh, which almost inevitably trace back to the idea of blazing with the fire or light of the gods. When Diomedes shines with his martial virtue, it is Athena who shines in him and as him. 
He is virtuous to the extent that he is divine. At one point, the ideas I've offered so far overlap, and Diomedes, uh, his empowerment by Athena, is described in an, in an extended simile connecting it to nature. So here's the simile. She spoke thus, great-eyed Athena. Now the strong rage tripled, took hold of him, and as of a lion whom the shepherd among his fleecy flocks in the wild lands grazed as he leapt the fence of the fold, but has not killed him, but only stirred up the lion's strength, and can no more fight him off, but hides in the steading, and the frightened sheep are forsaken, and these are piled pell-mell on each other in heaps, while the lion raging still leaps out again over the fence of the deep yard. Such was the rage of strong Diomedes as he closed with the Trojans. Here is Diomedes, lion, Athena, and mortal man. In this moment, this is his identity. The dominance of abstract monotheistic metaphysics has led to the idea that the self is something singular and in some important respects stable. It is, for example, a soul capable of eternal, unchanging life in a platonic, Cartesian, or religious sense. This idea, I would argue, is utterly foreign to oral cultures. Surely enough, there is something we might call the soul in archaic Greece, but it is defined more by the way it most often loses its identity in death than the way it maintains its identity in death. Exceptions to this rule, which exist, are achieved via ongoing relationships that go beyond any intrinsic capacity of the souls involved. What is the self, then? It's a node in a web of relations marked out by names, epithets, and similes. It's an ongoing event of taking on these relationships, putting them off, being caught in them, having them thrust upon it, escaping them, and so on. It's unstable and ever-changing. It's a subject in process, in contention, defined more by the shifting world around it than by internal characteristics. It is without essence. The relations that constitute the self are like a Venn diagram in which the human, the natural, and the divine shift in greater and lesser proportions. Ultimately, however, the real point is that the circles drawn around these terrains are themselves illusory and inconstant. There would be no clear conception of the divine versus the natural versus the human within this context. The self, finally, is an ongoing event, ever in flux, constituted by and constituting other such events. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a talk by Cadmus Herschel, a published academic with a PhD in philosophy teaching at the college level. He is also a practicing ceremonial magician with a long-standing relationship to ancient Celtic deities. He has published extensively on the Gods and Radicals website as well as in The Fenris Wolf, published by Tripart Books. Cadmus Herschel recently published a book called True to the Earth, Pagan Political Theology through Gods and Radicals Press. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net, that's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net, or my website, drvanessasinclair.net. Body's mystery and power. Come more creative and writers reason why the artistic world can't ultimately accept Taliban, indeed the final, across the world blow. 
It is a quality that manifests most, spiritual and physical, and perhaps a worthy statement of intent. Thanks again, I look. Writes, everyone carries a shadow. Documentation continues to unfold. Precise confrontation, conference. Still, I could never avoid thee. To forget nothing and illustrate that would be who we meet, whatever it is. A spiral, a serpent, the passions of the soul. Alkistus and Peter, electricity and elementals. Atonal, there are no existential safety nets. Imagination, not only two, both seen while. The reflected light of the moon isn't brutally revealing, but faint, suggestive, ocularly conducive to occultism. Eyes, just gotten to the point, the cool, that is communal, tricks and impressions of association and fantasy. This reflected light is also conducive to beauty in anything too. States. To couples, that it lessens contrast and thereby inherent dualisms. This has been well used in our own recent of the things that like-minded culture through the development of photography and cinema in which lightning techniques an entire scene have the music lyrics I believe we seen Science very seldom focus on harsh, directed light, but rather on subtle nuances of reflected light. Repetition that matters, but rather the space that is created via the difference. You see this concept, tasteless, Everything is because the sun is simply too bright to watch. We have become accustomed to watching the moon instead. We cherish what's visible and didn't know existed. We know anything regular is a, for the first time I'm telling, flipped in and how much I need and comfort to the human mind. In the case of the moon, literally so. It's not just a fairly familiar orb in your every move and the sky. We literally see the same side of the full moon most every time we watch it. The full moon in my time, I'll wrap my heart. Always displays the same side to us as it revolves around its own axis parallel to its revolving over in the sense. His habit with around the earth. And that takes just about the same amount of time. No wonder then we're as ears and minds. Fascinated by the dark side of the moon as we are 
in coming out of hers, ourselves. A photograph front of the cafe. The Landau is pulled by two horses. A here were no draw. Coachman and a footman, both in livery, are sitting my typewriter and activity, in fact, in thee, too. I also noticed, as the human gaze has gradually drifted from thee, the microcosmic, over thee further, or to allow for things to time, you see, and millennia. We have also downsized our capacity for, example, a friend bigger contexts. For the sake of official announcement, the golem and the dancing girl. Symbols in mythology used to consist of the most powerful and potent. Great cut up. Boggling stuff that helps solidify or godly shape. Today we're sadly striving for a brutal demythologizing. Same lines. Processed through technologies that allow neither longevity nor potent symbolism. Where is the expression of it? Associated with mythological moon today of life itself. Whether still or moving, particles inside this plastic, buzzers for my, of the tape recorder. After, figures, pattering blindly behind, enhance their lives. Not as tourists, who, fashion, all cultures have revered. Nine force in joint ventures with the matter. Dust. Perambulating provender. Masculine sun. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. The Germanic language has the moon as masculine and the sun as feminine. I for the discovery of the mother's masculine force, and the son, a warm, life-giving covering of her own failings, and the facts of perception. Climate of the psychic, come back and put what? And are attracted to each other, and overflow. I am amazed have more like each other and sort dead. A key to mythological strength is the use of symbols within the stories told. No wonder that the sun, print, and the moon have been such strong presences in human stories that most often retell sexual tales we deplete, and death and rebirth mysteries, into the evening events of art talks and music, is and goddesses, to the sky, attributed to the stronger forces out there in space, moon goddesses abound, one of the first occurrences of moon divinities is actually a male one. The Babylonian god, Sin. But from there, and we tend to, on, it's been mostly goddesses. Evening. Seems much better. And can become. See it remarkably in the body's fascia, a coherent web of the is to be. The interior of every, and 
the less it is embodied in the biology. Boys have penises and a group strength that is constantly situations in individuals' conscious life. On dichotomy, male, female, a mark of the primitive, mirror image, when we begin to break connective tissue to be, she, imagine.